This is Adam Rothberg for Off the Shelf. Today's guest in the studio is Vince Flynn, the number one New York Times best-selling author of 12 Rock'em Sock'em pulse-pounding international thrillers, 11 of them featuring super-secret agent Mitch Rapp. Flynn's novels are known for their detail and verisimilitude in depicting life behind the scenes in the world of espionage and counterterrorism, striking so close to home that he's developed a rabid following among the intelligence and national security community and attracted the attention of the world of film and television. His latest novel, American Assassin, is out now in hardcover, with his prior novel, Pursuit of Honor, already writing the bestseller lists. Welcome to Off the Shelf. Great to be here, Adam. So American Assassin is your 11th book featuring Mitch Rapp, but you do something a little bit different with this one. I go back, which, is, which was uh, something I always wanted to do when, when I introduced Rapp in Transfer of Power. Well, that was your second uh, book. That was my right? second book. But I, so I, I started writing about Mitch Rapp back in 95, so 15 years ago. And when I introduced him, he was in his mid-30s. I always knew that I would eventually want to go back and write about him in his 20s. Uh, because I've, with all of these various guys that I've met in the special forces and special operations community, you always kind of ask yourself, who chooses to do this for a living? You know, what, what guy decides at the age of 18 or 22, I'm going to go join the Navy SEAL so I can go to really dangerous places and kill bad guys? I mean, it takes a certain yeah. person. I mean, every everybody who's older than 18 or 22 can relate to that moment in your life where you're trying to decide, you reach a fork in the road, am I going to go to college, am I going to keep working, am I going to go to vote, whatever, whatever your options are. Very few of us decide, I want to go become one of the biggest bad you-know-what's on the planet and go smoke bad guys. I mean, it's it's a pretty interesting dynamic. So I delve into all of that with rap and what his motivation was when he graduated from Syracuse why, and how he was kind of surreptitiously recruited to join the CIA and how they were alarmed early on how good this guy was. They, they saw some real raw ability. And then I married up with Stan Hurley who is his trainer, uh, his reluctant trainer, because this guy's mad that Rap doesn't have any military experience because the only guys Hurley's ever trained are guys that have been special operators or special forces, and he doesn't want to deal with some college puke. And that Hurley character, I had more fun writing that character than any character I have ever written. So you're offering us, really, the Mitch Rap creation myth. Absolutely. You know, I, I think it's you. You go back to mythology. I, don't, I assume you read some mythology when you were a kid. Most of us did. Even as an adult. Yeah, as an adult, I love it as well. You're right. My kids are reading it now, and some of the, the great things about mythology is you you get to go back and learn about their parents, who their parents were, and how they became demigods or gods, and all this other crazy stuff. And so, you know, theoretically, I could keep walking this dog back. I've said for years, I want to go back and write a World War II espionage novel with director Stansfield, who appears in the first two books, dies at the beginning of the third book, and is kind of a mentor uh, to definitely to Kennedy and to Rapp to some extent. In fact, he, he came back in this book, and I've already gotten a couple of people who've called me up and said, it was really weird to have the guy alive again. Because he died at the beginning of the right. third book, and all of a sudden, you know, I've, I've brought him back, and, and people are very, you know, interested and excited about that. But yeah, it's well, that's what happens in prequels. Exactly, and you know, Adam, look at it this way: I'm 44. Hopefully, I'll be doing this for another 40 years. We do too. Yeah, that. and th that's a lot of books. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and I'm not one of these authors who's going to decide, you know, to go write you know, snow falling on cedars. I have nothing against books like that, but that's not my wheelhouse. That's not my strength. I don't think my audience would appreciate it. I know my publisher wouldn't care to uh, experiment that way. So I want to keep writing these page turners. And I figure there's there's three to four novels of rap in his 20s that, the, that my, you know, we're number one on Amazon right now in both Kindle and, uh, and traditional cool. hardcover. Yeah. So that's never happened for us. For me, it's never happened. And I, I, there's a reason, you know, we, we, we keep building sales every time we come out with a new book. Sales and marketing have done a great job, publicity, everybody. Part of it, though, is I think there's this real thirst to go back and see what rap was like at the beginning. And it allows people who've been afraid to jump into the series, they say, this is the perfect starting point because it's a prequel. 
I get right. to go right back to 23, and I'm I'm on the same footing as everybody else. And now I know how he became Mitch Rapp, he is. American and assassin. Along those lines, the Pan Am Lockerbie mm-hmm. incident plays a critical role in shaping him. And I'm reading the book, and I'm thinking, wow, you really timed this beautifully with everything that went on this summer. Well, and I'm <laughs> and I'm sure you remember when that happened in December of '88. I mean, I remember it vividly. I just finished college. And, um, you know, the news came out and found out that the 35, you know, kids from Syracuse who were coming home for Christmas break didn't make it back. And, you know, as a 22-year-old kid who just graduated from college, you think, man, what is that campus like right now? 35 students, that's a lot. And so years later, when I sat down to start the rap deal, I thought, again, who chooses to do this for a living? It's got to be somebody who's been burned, somebody who's either lost a parent or a loved one or somebody who's pretty passionate about it. Uh, you know, really no different than when you see these movies about these parents who find out that their kid has some strange disease and they mortgage the house and do everything they can to try to find the cure. Um, it's, it's not unreasonable to think of a, uh, well, you know, what? there's some rumors out there that after 9-11, uh, the U.S. Army and the Navy and the CIA and some other outfits did a fair amount of recruiting amongst the uh, NYPD and uh, fire department, uh, their families. Right, because they were motivated. They were highly motivated to say, you know what, I, I, I'll volunteer. I'd like to go over there and, and try to get even on this deal. So, yeah, that, that's kind of the backstory for, for RAP's motivation. One of the bombers was just released yeah. in custody in Scotland, mm-hmm. sitting down there in Lit- Libya. Libya. Might that be a plot line for a future Mitch Rapp book? It, it, it might. It's something <laughs> that has crossed my mind. Um, I, I get I get anxious about killing real world people. It, 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 some people might think that's like really you kill a lot of people in your books, and I'm I'm not ruling it out, but it's something that. Um, it crosses a line. I understand that. Well, yeah. it cross, you know, I'm, it crosses a line. I'm not sure it's a line I'm not willing to cross because <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. And, and the way I work, Adam, is usually until I sit down and really dive into the story, I don't make that decision. I, I kind of have a, an approach that um, nothing is off limits. And I very rarely discuss my ideas, uh, I mean, with my editor a little bit, my wife a little bit, my agent a little bit. And then when I'm in the thick of the story, I'll do some consulting with them. But I will, you will rarely hear me get up in front of a group of people and float ideas. I, you know, because part of it is I've been burned. I've, uh, you know, a few years ago I was out in L.A. and I spouted off some idea about, you know, the next book. And the next thing I know it was, it was in a TV series. And uh, so you just, as somebody who creates content, you have to be a little more careful about how you discuss what your next project is. Now let's talk about your fan base, particularly the the people in uniform and the clandestine services. You've really developed a, quite a following there. Why do you think that is? I think it's, uh, well, I'll throw a question at you since you work for the house. <laughs> <laughs> why do you think, why do you think that books thrillers written by reporters who who the where the hero is a reporter never seem to work well i can cheat because <laughs> i saw you answer this on another show i mean my 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 personal theory about why people in the uniform and and who are you know agents might yeah. like your books is that they are the heroes the yeah. clear cut heroes yep. in your books and they are fighting clear cut villains yep. and um like almost anyone who has somebody uh in corporate life or bureaucracy um you know maybe looking over their shoulder and telling them things they can and cannot do yep. your heroes are bristle against that and uh, generally disregard it and everybody likes to think that they, they would, they do would that lo- everybody the you, see you you nailed it if, if somebody <laughs> everybody <laughs> wishes they could stand up in that one meeting and just scream at the room, stop it. This is all BS. <laughs> <laughs> and point to the one guy or one gal who always raises their hand to ask the question that extends the meeting by 30 minutes and say, stop raising your hand. This is what we're going to do. We all know it's what we have to do. Let's just do it and stop the debate. And so these books are very satisfying in that way. But I also, there's that's part of it. And the other part of it is, 
I do believe with passion that, that the U.S. military is not the problem. The CIA is not the problem. The FBI is not the problem. The Secret Service isn't the problem. Uh, are they going to bat a thousand? Absolutely not. Uh, uh, is uh, Al Qaeda and the Taliban, are, are they the bad guys? Without a doubt. Make no apologies about it. Um, and I think if, if, this, if something like this had happened 40, 50 years ago, uh, we wouldn't even have this squeamishness in this country about waging this war the way it needs to be waged. So you're being adapted by the people in the services that really is actually helped perpetuate your writing career because now they're coming to you offering yeah. you tips and yep. you got this right, you didn't get this right, next time you need to. So. Yep. Yeah, so, so w they come to me, which makes the my research less difficult. But what it's what I ha what I have had to do, and I and I haven't begun to appreciate it until probably four or five years ago. I've had to do some self censor. Um, there's stuff that I have ended up guessing. Um, that I, you know, uh, I mean, highly classified stuff that I will not put in these books because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. And I, don't, I also don't want to hurt our national security. Now, you know, in extreme measures, when I, I you know, make the targets in Washington, D.C., uh, a bunch of noontime restaurants where, you know, bigwigs go to dine, um, that was one of those things that it wasn't classified. Did I know I was probably giving the enemy an idea? Uh, yeah, I did. But at the same time, I, th I think that that is an idea that the enemy would have arrived at eventually. And so what I wanted to do was say to all the people in Washington, uh, look at this. You, you, you know this is a problem. Take a harder look at it. Close down some streets. You know, I, st I still am mystified that you can go to the monocle in Washington, D.C. virtually any day of the week when the Senate is in session. And you will walk into that place at noon and you will find a dozen, two dozen senators having lunch, maybe a couple of Supreme Court justices. And you know who's out in front? No one. There's not a single cop. I mean, they should have two, two guys in full SWAT gear. Uh, well, three, really, one at each end of the street and one standing outside the front door. Every noon, as long as those guys are in there and they've, they've got to start thinking that way. But, you know, it's these agencies are over. Uh, stressed and overtaxed. I mean, if they got to start doing that at all these various restaurants in town, it's going to make their life difficult. But look to Israel for our example of what our life could become quickly. Uh, suicide bombers on buses, suicide bombers in shopping malls, walking into restaurants. I mean, that is unfortunately eventually what's going to happen. This, this goofball up at Times Square, he almost pulled it off. And so, you know, I... I we we are not going to bat a thousand. Sooner or later, something's going to happen. I just hope it's uh, you know it's it's minimal. And what's the best compliment you've received from someone in the clandestine services? Uh, your your books are a little too accurate. <laughs> 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 well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you. Uh, it's hard because I I have I'm such a fan of theirs, and and they they like the books. Um, when I finished American Assassin, I gave the manuscript to somebody who works at the CIA and had been in Beirut back in the 80s. And the guy read it and said, I can't believe you weren't there. He said, you just nailed it. You've got it. It's, it's exactly what it was like for us back then. And, you know, that's a pretty big compliment, having not, having not been there. The, you know, the compliment that I love even more is when you get the, the military guys because they're so precise in their training. That when I write a scene and they come up after and say, oh, man, you just nail it. That is exactly how we would have hit that building or that's how we would have hit that village or whatever. That is very satisfying, you know, to have a, a four-star general in the United States Army tell you that, you know, he's a huge fan of your books. And could you I'm please sure lighten up on the is. torture? And you're also going to be starting a new series in which you're collaborating, right? With Brian Haig. Very excited about it. He's, uh, I'm reading Capital Game right now, which is Brian's most recent book. And the guy is, he's one of my favorite writers in the world, bar none. And when we were able to strike this deal with him as a, you know, for a partnership, I, I couldn't have been more excited. So that book is going to publish this spring, and it's going to be about an NYPD counterterrorism detective. Well, so there are a few signs that you've really hit the big time. Your number one bestseller, you're putting books out in collaboration. <laughs> you've been adapted for the movies. And here's the really big one. You have 
two different dust jacket colors for your newest book. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that that was a, that, that that was a mark oh, of absolutely. the big time. All right. And you're looking very G-man in the photo on the back. Am I? I well, you know, that's that is one of my uh, Adam. That is one of my least favorite days of the year. The new photo. Well, I wouldn't mess with you. You could be a stand-in for Mitch Rapp. Uh, as I, as I uh, said, told somebody in Hollywood a couple of weeks ago, I said, well, you should see me with my shirt off. It's not so pretty. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming to the studio, Vince. <laughs> it's my pleasure, Adam. Good to talk to you. American Assassin is published by Atria Books, and the paperback of Pursuit of Honor is out now from Pocket Books. For more on American Assassin and Vince Flynn, you can visit www.simonandschuster.com or www.vinceflynn.com.